I guess we are ready to get going. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. All right, one second here, please. Okay, Dave, are you ready to uh, take it away here? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll try to move fast because um, really, am, genus Amanita is really pretty extensive and um, there's so much can be said and it was actually kind of hard for me to pick um, seven observations here to, to get things going, one from each section of genus Amanita. And uh, the first we're going to start with that there are two subgenera to begin with. Um, subgenus Amanita and subgenus Lepidella. Now these are the classic subdivisions according to Boss. Um, they, um, um, a mycologist from, from Holland who uh, came up with these um, classifications. Um, subgenus Amanita. Okay, so this is a little confusing at, right off the bat because there's genus Amanita subgenus Amanita, and in, in subgenus Amanita, there is section Amanita. But first, what do we mean by these subgenera? Subgenus Amanita, the, all the mushrooms in subgenus Amanita have non-amylate spores, so you need melters, melters re reagent. Um, and, um, Non amyloid means that when you, if you get a good thick spore print and you put a drop of melters onto it, the spores will not react. They will not turn blue, black, or purple. They, they will just maybe take on the, the uh, color of the melters, which is a little bit like orangish. So honestly, I find it a little hard to tell the difference between non reactive and uh, dextrinoid, which is uh, when they turn purple. Um, but with Amanita mushrooms, it's usually pretty clear, either non-amyloid or amyloid. So to begin with, subgenus Amanita, non-amyloid spores. There are three sections in subgenus Amanita. Section Amanita, section Vaginate, and uh, section Caesariae. And to begin with, section Amanita. Um, section Amanita has really the iconic a Amanita mushroom, Amanita muscaria, which, which has several varieties. We have Amanita uh, muscaria variety Gesawii here in the east of North America. Uh, around the world, there are a few other varieties. Uh, but I did not choose um, muscaria to be the representative um, for um, section Amanita. So this is once again, non-amyloid spores. And let me just, okay, so, so I, I chose here Amanita frustiana. Uh, the reason why I chose frustiana is frustiana is very easily confused. Um, with mushrooms from section validae, which we'll, we'll discuss later. Um, but just to um, sort of um, um, round up some of the traits associated with section Amanita, um, first of all, the spores are non amyloid, as I said, and often the um, margin of the cap is striate in section Amanita. Not always though, this is a little bit of a problem and, and Frustiana really sort of gets point, this point across fairly well because young versions of Amanita Frustiana might not have um, striate cap margin. The caps, cap margin becomes striate in, in um, at maturity. Uh, but if you look at this mushroom here, it looks a little bit like muscaria. It also looks a little bit like what we'll look at later, um, Amanita um, flaviconia. Very easy to confuse with Amanita flaviconia, which has um, deposits on the cap 
these are universal veil deposits, uh, these little warts on the cap. Um, you'll see this on muscaria. You'll see it on a variety of mushrooms in section Amanita. You also see similar sorts of deposits um, associated with mushrooms from section Validae, which is completely different. We'll get to that later. Uh, for us, here, see, see on the line the cap margin, there are striations. These are fairly weak striations you'll see in this picture because this is a fairly young mushroom. Um, and, and the whole idea of striations along the margin can be a little bit tricky, a little bit tricky. So how do you tell, how do you know if you have a mushroom like Frasiana or Muscaria representing section Amanita, as opposed to something that might be very similar representing section, uh, say, Validae. Well, this is where you, you really need to have the um, Meltzer's reagent to see if the spores react. Um, unfortunately, Meltzer's is very difficult to come by uh, because one of the ingredients is mel in Meltzer's is um, coral hydrate, which is a controlled substance. And so it's difficult to obtain Meltzer's. If you're lucky enough to um, get two things, get past two obstacles, get your medical doctor to write a prescription for, for Meltzer's, which my doctor agreed to do. He, he said he would do it for me, but I couldn't find a pharmacy to fill, um, to fill it. So for a while, I had no Meltzer's. And for a while, a, a friend of mine from NJMA, uh, supplied me with a small amount of Meltzer's that kept me going for about a year. And then um, this past year, I found some Meltzer's, someone who, um, who I know online, uh, I won't go beyond that, um, supplied me with a pretty uh, generous supply of Meltzer's. Uh, but anyway, so this mushroom right here, Amanita frustiana, Amanita frustiana, White spore print, all Amanitas have white spore prints. There are a few from section Lepidella, mainly, that have spore prints that might be a little bit sort of coffee color tinged. Uh, that's actually a rod to us, then coffee, uh, cafe LA, right? The, the coffee, you know, with um, uh, milk in it, um, a little bit off white, but most Amanitas have white spore prints. All of the Amanitas in section Amanita have white spore prints. They do not react. Also, mushrooms in section Amanita have a uh, partial veil. All Amanitas have universal veil, of the, although the universal veils are highly variable, uh, morphologically speaking. Um, not all Amanitas have partial veil. Partial veil is the thing that leaves a ring on, a, on the stock sometimes, most times. Sometimes the ring might disappear. And some partial veils are more persistent than others. Um, in Amanita frustiana, the one we see here, the partial veil is fairly persistent. Notice the, um, the base of the stock has um, this marginate. A marginate uh, a base. Uh, we can also call that a marginate guava uh, because the bottom of the, the mushroom, the bottom of the stock here, is that, that little like gutter around, the, around the, um, the upper edge of the base is part of the guava. That's part of the universal veil. It breaks apart. Some of it is left on the cap as uh, deposits, warts. And some of it forms this little, like a gutter along the upper part of the um, base of the stock. Uh, Rod Tullis calls that the rolled sock margin. Um, it's associated mainly with um, mushrooms representing section Amanita, subsection uh, pan, uh, Pantherae, or Pantherae. Um, so I think Frustiana is put into that subsection, but you know what? I'd have to review that. I'm not sure. 
Um, but once again, partial veil leaving a ring on the stock, universal veil leaving warts on the cap, cap margin more or less striate, sometimes more than other times. And when they, when they mature, the striations become a little more prominent. Uh, the striations, by the way, are these little um, radial uh, grooves along the margin. They're hardly noticeable here in, in this one. Um, how do I know that this is Frustiana as opposed to something from Section Valade? Uh, well, one, one clue is um, the universal veil patches on, on the cap are, are not so much yellow, they're more a little, a little more white. Um, the base of the stock has that rolled sock vulva, but you can be fooled by these things. So the key really is you have to be able to see if the spores are amyloid. Spores, non-amyloid section, uh, amanita. Okay. So we'll, we'll come later and we'll see one that looks a lot like um, Frostianum. Now, section vaginate. Uh, Rod Tulas has been working on section vaginate now for several years, and he's pretty much wrapping up what, what we know about section uh, vaginate. Lots of undocumented species in, in section vaginate. As of maybe four or five years ago, many species now or many of the taxa, let's say, have now been assigned species status provisionally. This one right here is something that Rod has called um, Amanita luzinensis, um, base, um, named after the county where I live, um, Luzon County, Pennsylvania. And um, sometimes the section vaginate mushrooms will feature what's called a zonate cap. So you see like there's these concentric zones of color on the cap of this mushroom, this Amanita luzinensis. This one is pretty, pretty strikingly um, zonate. There's actually pretty much four zones of color. Um, the, the disc is dark, right, right in the very middle. It's a little bit shiny looking. That's probably just a, a reflection of light. But you have the the disc is dark, then there's a lighter um, annulus of um, lighter color, and then there's another thin, dark color, and then the margin, which is strongly striate. Now, mushrooms in section vaginate are pretty much all have striate margins and noticeably striate margins from the time that they begin to expand. A very, very, very young mushroom six from section vaginate might not appear to be uh, have a striate margin simply because it, it just hasn't expanded enough this this is a pretty big mushroom for section okay. vaginate yes um, does this amanita have forked gills or no amanita has that feature um you know some of them have gills that that do i think you know what i think the fork gills might be a little bit more um, likely in section vaginate than the other sections. Um, most amanitas do not have fork gills. You know, that's a good question because they, I haven't really thought about that a whole lot. Yes. The reason why I said that is because when you look on the estriations, they show forks. If you look again, I saw few. Yeah, the forks. Uh, uh, seem to follow the the gills. You can and see. Is there a picture of the gills for this one? Because that's a really good mushroom. Uh, I, I'm sorry, really good question. Um, oh, I don't have pictures of the gills for this one. Uh, I should have. Well, may, maybe we can see later. Maybe we'll, maybe someone mm -hmm. will have something yeah. else. But but um, section vaginate. All of the mushrooms except for a very few species. There's like three species, I think two of which are known to occur in North America. Lack partial veil. There's no ring on the stock here. Um, there are two 
um, two or three species of from section vaginatae that have partial veil. And I think Rod calls them the ringed ringless amanitas, which, which of course is an oxymoron. Um, but there are a few species from section vaginatae that do have partial veil that, that leave a ring. The ring is not that persistent generally, but for the most part, mushrooms representing section vaginatae have no ring, meaning no partial veil. And they do have, of course, all amanitas have universal veil. And the universal veil uh, representing, uh, uh, shown on mushrooms representing section vaginatae is kind of variable. Now this one's kind of membranous. Uh, the bottom of the stock you'll see here, there's kind of this sac-like vulva. It's fairly membranous, meaning it's, it's kind of like a membrane that rips apart as the cap expands and breaks through the universal veil. Um, some have what's called a friable of a basal vulva, meaning um, the vulva kind of breaks apart very easily. Um, and some have universal veil that really, really disintegrates almost completely. Um, now, so this is one reason why I said to begin that we can, we can go for a long, long time talking about amanita traits, even within a single section, we, we can spend a lot of time. So this one here has a white membranous, persistent sac-like vulva, basal vulva, which is the re uh, remnants of the uh, universal veil that's evident on the bottom of the stock. Uh, but some have a universal veil that turns gray and disintegrates. And, and, and all you'll see is a little bit of gray material deposited on the bottom of the stock and on the cap. This one also has a fair amount of ornamentation on the stock or the stipe. So this is this sort of uh, sub flocose material making this little ornamentation here you can see on the stock. They don't all have that. Some of them have smooth stock. So there's within any given section of Amanita, there's always a fair amount of variation. When it comes to section vaginate, what are the constant factors? The constant factors are striate cap margin. And um, you know, honestly, that's about it. Uh, because you could also say that lack of, of partial veil, uh, but there are a few species in section vaginate that don't, that, that do have partial veil that, and, and sometimes form a ring on the stock. Uh, the prominent striations uh, on the cap though, are pretty, that's pretty constant. Okay, so we've got, yes, go ahead. Quick question before we move on. Did your Luzonensis um, have a number before it got a name? I forget the number. Okay. It, it did have, a, it, it probably had a number for a while because uh, Rod Tullos will always, you know, if he finds some, uh, a sequence, uh, meaning a DNA sequence that doesn't fit anything else, and he doesn't know what else to call a mushroom, he will sometimes assign it a provisional number before he assigns it a provisional species name. And provisional means that it still needs to stand the test of time. And perhaps maybe we need to find a few more examples of the same uh, taxon um, um, in other parts of, of um, the world. Um, now, my understanding is Luzarnensis. I mean, Luzarnensis is standing up pretty well to that because uh, I think that a few years ago at NEMF in New York State, up there in Geneseo, um, someone found a, a Luzarnensis. Um, so that, that helps. It always helps to expand the, the geographic range of, of where the, the taxon has been found. So. I'm, but I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to, to what the number used to be. Uh, it may not have had a number. I think, I think uh, Rod kind of went pretty quickly into naming this one. It's, it's pretty distinctive. 
it seems pretty distinctive with the, the four zones of color on the cap. And it's pretty large. Anyway, that's any other sec any other questions on section vaginate? Okay, now we've got section Cesarie. Section Cesarie, I think, can best be described to begin with as pretty much they look like uh, mushrooms from section vaginate, except with prominent partial dial that leaves uh, a ring on the stalk that's rather persistent in most cases. So here we have what I believe is an example of Amanita banningiana, um, named after Richard Banning, um, a, a mycologist who, who helped um, get get this taxon recognized as 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 an. Um, a oh, it was Mary Banning. Yeah, Mary Banning. It was Mary Banning from Baltimore. Oh, why did I think it was Richard Banning? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, Mary, you know what? The, anyway, whatever. I Thank you for correcting me there. Okay, so Mary Banning. So notice, notice that we have a mushroom here that pretty much looks like section vaginate. Uh, sort of a thin stalk. Um, the cap is generally, um, the, the diameter of the cap is generally, you know, close to um, the height of the of the stipe, uh, we have the prominent marginal striations on the cap. Those are the grooves that line um, the margin of the cap. Um, we have usually with section Caesarea, we have um, uh, a membranous vulva that's like a like a sac um, on on the bottom of the of the stipe. Um, there you Luke is going to show us that now. It's very similar to mushrooms from section vaginate. The main difference is with mushrooms from, from section Cesarea, you have a, a partial veil that leaves a, a persistent ring on the stock. Uh, so there you can see. Here. Now, it can be very tricky. Very tricky indeed, because this ring might, might drop off. Usually it doesn't. At least with most of the mushrooms from um, section Caesarea, the ring will persist. Also, in section Caesarea, you're you're more likely to have gills um, that are not just pure white. Like you'll notice here in this one, the gills have just a tiny bit of like like a yellowish tinge. Now, but here's what makes Caesarea a very difficult section. There are some mushrooms in section Caesarea um, that have very white gills. They're not brightly colored on the cap and they're small. Um, I, I believe a few of those species are Amanita virginiana, Amanita uh, pechispermia, um, and Amanita pseudo virginiana, I think, is, is one of them. Small, really, really small mushrooms um, with partial veil forming a ring on the stock, but the ring might drop off very easily. So we can talk about uh, morphological um, traits associated with the sections of Amanita, um, but these traits. Are, are somewhat variable and maybe not always as persistent as we would like. So usually we think of section Cesarea uh, as having like brightly colored caps, not always. Some of them are pretty dull. Large, graceful mushrooms, not always. Some of them are small and sort of um, the short stalks um, and always having a persistent um, annulus on the stock, not always. Some of them have um, a partial veil that will leave a, maybe leave a ring on the stock for a while or maybe, maybe not. So Banningiana though is, is pretty um, 
um, pretty constant. You know, the ring is usually there. You usually see a ring on banding the eye. It's one of the more common um, species from section Caesarea in northeastern North America. Okay, so that wraps up subgenus Amanita, the ones that have the non amyloid spores. All of those three sections, each of those three sections, uh, you'll get a spore print that's white. And if you put Meltzer's reagent on the spores, um, you won't get a darkening of the spores, except for maybe, you know, the color of the Meltzer's, which tends to be kind of yellowish or yellowish orange. You know, it'll, you might, you might see that color, but you won't see black or dark blue. Uh, and, and by the way, when you put the drop of, drop of Meltzer's on your spore print, usually it's right around the perimeter of where the drop of Meltzer's lands on, um, hopefully you, hopefully, do not do this, by the way, do not test for amyloidity um, by, by having a spore print on a piece of paper, especially white paper. Um, white paper is amyloid. It'll react with the spores. And you, and if you put melters on a spore print that's collected on bleached white paper, it'll turn black, even even if the spores are not amyloid. So, so I always collect my spore prints on microscope slides, um, on a microscope slide because I'm going to use that anyway to probably look at the spores under a microscope. But even if you're not going to do that, you should collect the spore print on a non uh, absorbent um, surface, a hard surface, plastic or glass or something like that, um, that's not going to react with the melters. Um, anyway, that does wrap up subgenus Amanita. Those are the three sections where the mushrooms have spores that are non-amyloid. Now we move on to part B, subgenus Lepidella in the sense of bus. Now this is, this is changing possibly. Um, there's, there's a debate going on right now amongst mycologists about what, what constitutes the sections of Amanita and what constitutes genus Amanita. Um, some mycologists be, uh, believe that the mushrooms that were traditionally placed in subgenus Lepidella section Lepidella, which is number seven, which we'll get to here, um, which are saprobic. Some, all, all Amanitas except for a few in section Lepidella, subgenus Lepidella, are mycorrhizal, meaning the, they come from a fungus that associates with a living tree, and that's a long-standing association, um, presumably. Um, but there are a few species in subgenus Lepidella, section Lepidella, that are saprobic, meaning they can pop up on a lawn where there's no trees of any kind have been there for, for many, many years. Um, so in other words, the mushroom is saprobic. It's, it's just growing from some sort of decaying vegetable matter in the ground. That's, that is unique in genus Amanita. And because of that uniqueness, some mycologists believe that some mushrooms traditionally put into subgenus Lepidella, section Lepidella, need to be put into their own genus, Sapro Lepidella. Or I'm sorry, Sapro Amanita, not Sapro Lepidella, Sapro Amanita. Um, we're going here with the traditional subdivisions of Boss. According to Boss, any Amanita mushroom that has amyloid spores, meaning you get the spore print, you put a drop of Meltzer's on it, and the spores turn either black or very dark blue, you get an amyloid reaction. My experience with mushrooms from subgenus Lepidella is the spores are very strongly amyloid, with a few exceptions where it's a little bit tricky. But the amyloid reaction that I get with, amin with amanita mushrooms from subgenus Lepidella is 
Uh, the reaction is that the Meltzer's turns the spores black, black, not, not, not just blue, black. So anyway, there are four sections in subgenus Lepidella. In each of these sections, the spores are amyloid, meaning uh, put Meltzer's onto the spore print and it turns the spores black. And if you, have, if you don't have a very thick spore print, you still might be able to tell an amyloid reaction by viewing the spores mounted in Meltzer's under a microscope. And, um, but it's, it can be a little bit tricky uh, because the Meltzer's itself will change the color of the spores. And sometimes it can be a little bit tricky. Are you seeing a, a spore that is um, truly where the spore walls have been darkened by the reacting to the Meltzer's or are you simply just seeing um, the spore wall being made a little bit more prominent because the Meltzer's itself is, is, is not clear. You know, Meltzer's reagent is kind of sort of like a yellow orange color. But anyway, four sections, section validate. Now, remember that mushroom that we started with, um, Amanita frustiana? Okay, so look at this one. This mushroom here looks a lot like Amanita frustiana. What's the main difference? The main difference is this mushroom has amyloid spores. This mushroom represents species Amanita flavor rubens. Another difference, flavor rubens, like most mushrooms in subgenus Lepidella has a cap margin that is not striate. No grooves along the margin. Now, when I say that, that comes with a little bit of a disclaimer because sometimes the cap can dry out in situ as the mushroom just um, stays there in, in, in nature. And sometimes when the cap dries out, the cuticle contracts a little bit, grabs onto um, the lines along which the, the gills run, and we get what I like to call pseudostriations. Now in this one, there's no pseudostriations. You can see this cap margin is clearly non-striate. Other differences between this one and Frostiana, well, look at, look at the, the, the deposits of the universal veil on the cap are pretty whitish. A lot of times in Flavor Rubens, uh, which is also called the yellow blusher, um, the deposits on the cap will be yellowish, but not always. This one, you know, some of them are a little yellowish and some of them are kind of white, right? If I run the disc, the middle of the cap, you can see they're white. So that's a little bit tricky. Um, the, the, the partial veil on this has left a ring that's pretty yellow. You wouldn't get that on Frostiana. Also, another, another difference, uh, uh, the ring on Frostiana would, is gonna be white. Uh, but on the bottom here of the stock, look, it is not a marginate basal vulva. Here we have um, a basal bulb. Oh, and by the way, um, mushrooms in section vaginate, no basal bulb. Mushrooms in section caesarea, no basal bulb. In other words, there's no, it doesn't get thick on the bottom of the stock. Um, mushrooms in section amanita do have, some do have basal bulbs. Um, but anyway, this one here. So really, I think the easiest thing to confuse is section amanita with section validate. This, we're now in section validate with this um, Amanita flavor Rubens. So there's no, the, the vulva is not a marginate. It's not like a gutter running right around the bottom of the stock. Here we have just some plates of grainy um, yellow uh, dust kind of stuff that, that has formed these little patches on the bottom of the stock. Uh, that's another trait associated with flavor Rubens. And a few other um, species 
in um, section validate. Another one that's very easy to confuse, not only with um, Frasiana or Muscarium, which are in section Amanita, but also with Flavorubens, which we're looking at now, is Flavoconia. Amanita Flavoconia is one of the most common mycorrhizal mushrooms in my area here in Northeast Pennsylvania. And very easy to confuse um, Flavoconia with Flavorubens. This one's Flavorubens. Um, how do you tell Flavoconia from Flavorubens? Flavoconia usually You're calling has, this Flavorubens? Excuse me? You're calling this mushroom on the screen now Flavorubens? Yeah, it's Flavorubens. Oh, I would disagree. What, why would you disagree? It's way too yellow. Flavo Rubens has some reddish Rubens coloring. Yeah, sometimes you only see it if you cut it and look in the, look, okay, you know, okay, maybe you you know, I might forget. Let's look back. Look back That's, at what did I call this? Yeah, what is this did. called on Mushroom Observer? Because I might, I might be forgetting. I think you are, because I saw Flavoconio at the top. Oh, it's Flavoconia. I fooled myself with this one. Yep, this is Flavoconia. And Flavoconia is called yellow patches. That's the common name. And this one doesn't have yellow patches. It has white patches in the middle of the stuff. Oh, well, thank you, Susan. Uh, good, no, good those eye. are yellow to me on this screen. A few whitish right. in the middle, but mostly... Right in the middle, they're white. Yeah, but, but, that's, but that's actually... That's a little unusual for flavoconium to have them white. I see this mushroom all the time and it's, this is what it looks like. It's very well, yellow. Oh. Well, I'll tell you what, Susan, I bring home plenty of Amanitas where I am not sure whether it's flavorubens or flavoconia. Now up there in the Adirondacks, you're gonna find almost always flavoconia because flavoconia is more apt to, to associate with conifers um, um flavor rubens is a, is mainly an oak associate but it looks honestly it looks just like this and you know what looking at this now even though i said flavoconium um i may have based that partly on the spore dimensions Honestly, you know, you make a good point. I should have picked one here that was a little bit more obviously one or the other. That's, but maybe it's good. Maybe this is a good thing. That's okay. It's still in the right, correct section then? That's in the correct section. But okay. you know what? Here's what you do if you're not sure. You section the mushroom vertically and look in the base of the stock. If you see some reddish brown staining. Yes context of the base of the stock, then you probably have flavor Rubens. And you know what? Honestly, I have seen a few examples of Flavoconium where there was some sort of discoloration in the base of the stock. At least I was pretty sure there were Flavoconia. Uh, but yeah, I did call this one Flavoconium. So, but, of, but all the things I said, I could have been describing flavor Rubens except for the staining. The, right, I, I agree because anytime I've ever found flavor Rubens, um, you just have to scratch the base and, and you'd get this reddish stain like rubescence. Yeah, sometimes you need to cut right through it and look, look inside the context if, if it's, the, the, the staining can be slow to develop. And, and when I find flower rubens, it's always, it, it always seems to be on the a margin or the edge of a woods with a field, whether that means anything. I don't know. No, I, I actually, Dorothy, I agree. Most of the flower rubens I find is in open areas um, where there's oak trees. And flavoconia tends to be more of a forest mushroom. Right. Uh, I yes, yes, I agree. Otherwise, those those two species can be really difficult to tell apart. I fooled myself right here. I thought I was for a minute, for a moment there I was looking at Flavor Rubens. 
All right, well, uh, let's move on to the next section, okay, so we can keep talking about the section. Yeah, sections. we need to move along. Okay, Amadella. Section Amadella. So what are the things that characterize section Amadella? A thick membranous universal veil that, that leaves a really prominent basal vulva can be easily confused with um, section vaginate because of that, because a lot of sections in vaginate have the um, membranous uh, cup-like, uh, sac-like basal vulva. Uh, the, the vulva in, uh, the basal vulva in Amadella tends to be thicker than um, vaginate. Um, some of the vaginate show a fair amount of um, reddish brown staining. This one does. Okay, so I, I hope I haven't faked myself out again because I think I probably called this thing pseudovulvata. Amanita pseudovulvata. Um, Amanita vulvata, I believe, is the type species for section um, amadella. Pseudovulvata tend, vulvata tends to be a little bit shorter and stouter than than uh, vulvata. Also, pseudo, pseudo vulvata, sometimes this one doesn't show it. Maybe I should have picked something different here uh, for this section uh, because sometimes um, mushrooms in section amadella have striate cap margin. Most mushrooms in subgenus lepidella, which includes section amadella, have non striate cap margins well with with an asterisk because sometimes you get pseudo striations but mushrooms in section amadella especially pseudo vulvata i think uh, is one species where where this is fairly likely you get striations along the cap margin this one doesn't show it because this is a pretty young one uh, but pseudo vulvata I mean, pseudo vulvata in particular often has short striations along the cap margin, no partial veil. With an, here's another asterisk. There is a North American species, Amanita pechiana, that has a fleeting partial veil that sometimes leaves a ring on the stock. I believe there might be another um, taxon from section Amadella that leaves a ring on the stock or, or at least has a partial veil that, that's some, that grows in Africa. I'm not sure I'd need to check that. But here's another asterisk. Mushrooms in section Amadella often have what we would call flocose ornamentation on the stipe. So this like fluffy stuff on the stipe, on the stock. And sometimes as the, as the cap expands, it drags the flocose, the margin of the cap might drag the flocose material on the stock up into a little pile um, that makes a little, like a not a true annulus around um, near the top of the stock. So that's tricky also. So you might think, oh, I've got, this, this Amanita has a ring. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there a question? No, I'm sorry. I was telling my kid to be quiet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I've seen on, on Pseudovulvana, the, the species we're looking at here, I've seen um, what looks like a ring on the stock, but it's just like a little pile of flocose material. Um, the Morphology of the basal vulva is sometimes important. Um, Pseudovulvata tends to form an all, a subglobose uh, basal vulva, meaning it's not all that much more elongated than, than, a, uh, um, than a sphere. Um, and usually there's a split in the basal vulva on, on pseudovulvata. I, Amanita vulvata is the, is the um, type species for section Amadella. And I think there's some controversy now over whether that even that species even occurs in North America. 
species. Uh, there are other species in, in section Amidala, and some of them are probably undocumented. And I believe there has been recent renewed interest in studying section Amidala in terms of trying to um, document the different taxa um, that comprise section Amidala. Amyloid spores. Spores are strongly amyloid um, in section Amidala. Section phil Philaidae. Um, section Philaidae is where the really most toxic of the Amanitas come from, in particular Amanita Philaides, which we see here. And this is an import. It's a European species. It has been brought to America um, on the roots of trees that have been planted. And it took off like crazy in, along the West Coast in California. Um, and in the Eastern part of the country, it didn't quite take off like crazy, but it's here. And this is, this is Amanita uh, philaides. Uh, now we, a more common taxon from section Philaidae in the Eastern United States is the thing we call destroying angels. This thing is called a death cap. Okay, it's, it's really, really terribly poisonous. It's got like a greenish cap. There's like a little bit of a green sort of a tint on the cap. It's got a partial veil, which leaves a persistent ring. You can't really see it right here in this picture. It's got a universal veil that forms a sac-like basal vulva. So it's like coming out of a sac, uh, persistent sac-like limbate. Limbate means um, that the um, margin of the vulva extends up along the, uh, the, the stock. Um, and this one doesn't, you can't really see the partial veil really well be, because it hasn't broken apart yet. Actually, you can see, there it is, there's yeah, right the partial there. veil. Yeah, there it is. So this time we see the partial veil in an unopened button. And it's, it's just, a, a, in this case, a membrane that is covering the fertile surface, the gills. Uh, now, once this cap expands a little more, this partial veil will tear away. Oh, look on the far left here. Even this right little there. guy here is actually the best example. It's, it's forming a ring, forming a skirt-like ring on the upper stalk. Um, so what are the traits associated with section Philaidae? Non striate cap margin. Now, on the other hand, I have seen examples of white uh, mushrooms, the destroying angels, of which there are three or four species that occur in Eastern North America, uh, Amanita bisporogera, Amanita amerivirosa, uh, um, Amanita sturgeonii, and uh, then there's one other one. I'm sorry that the name escapes right, me right now. Um, it's excuse me. It's helmetensis. I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Um, helmetensis, like helmetabog. Oh wow, that's a fifth one. Because there's another one too that begins with A, I think. Um, wow. So anyway, they were for a long time. They were all Amanita verosa, the white ones, destroying angels. <laughs> and then it turns out Amanita verosa is a European species, doesn't even occur in North America. Um, but not well, so I guess there's like five different white destroying angels. Um, the non striate cap margin, but that can be tricky because if you find some of these uh, uh, section Philaidae mushrooms in, in a situation where the weather has got dry and then got moist and then got cold or different sort of weather variations. Um, the cap cuticle, meaning the, the covering of the cap surface, um, can shrink and constrict along the lines of the gills near the margin of the cap and form pseudostriations. So you might think you have found a, a mushroom that, that's in section 
Amanita, for instance, but it might be section Philaidae. How do you really tell the difference? Well, you need melters. You need, you need to um, uh, see if the spores are amyloid. All of the spores, um, all of the mushrooms in section Philaidae have spores that are amyloid. And, and this is from not very far from where I live, this Amanita Philaides that I found here. Actually, right near, um, right near the, the headquarters for uh, American uh, Red Cross <laughs> building um, in Luzerne County on a lawn where they have planted some, um, some pine trees. Okay, so that's section Philaides. Or I'm sorry, Philaidae. One more section, also from section Lepidella. This is the controversial section, section Lepidella, where some of the mushrooms, some of the taxa in, that Boz put into section Lepidella are now considered to represent a different genus, Sapro Amanita. Um, this, this is not one of them. Look at the size of this thing. That's my hand there holding this. This is um, Amanita atkinsoniana. Um, and that's like a pretty big water bottle. I think it's a quart or a, a that's a one liter bottle, I believe, um, uh, next to that mushroom. I don't find this species very often around here, but I, I just couldn't help but include this in, in the discussion because this is really, really, uh, quite a specimen. Um, section Lepidella, non-striate cap margin. Um, appendiculate cap margin. Uh, there's another word for you, appendiculate. Appendiculate means that parts of the universal veil will cling to the cap margin and hang along the cap margin. You can see it a little bit on this one. Part, parts of the cap margin show this material that's hanging, um, clinging to, to the bottom of the cap margin. So that is appendiculate material. That's the universal veil. Um, sectional epidella, most of the mushrooms, uh, all of the mushrooms that I understand uh, representing section epidella have partial veil, but the partial veil is often not persistent. In other words, the, the cap expands, uh, the partial veil breaks apart, does not form a ring, and just falls off. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. The bottom of the stock on, for mushrooms in, in section Lepidella usually, usually has a prominent basal bulb, like this one does here. Um, the universal veil will often be deposited on the basal bulb as warts, and one of the things that distinguishes this particular species, Amanita atkinsoniana, is that the basal uh, vulval warts um, on, on the bottom of the stalk go all the way down the stalk. So there's warts not only on the upper shoulder of, of the basal bulb, uh, but all the way down the basal bulb. So, so that's one reason why we could say this is uh, an example of Amanita atkinsoniana. Now, all of these things I've said, oh, oh, and amyloid spores. Mushrooms from section Lepidella have amyloid spores. Some of the ones, there are a few species that uh, Rod likes to call, Rod Trulas likes to call them fence hangers. Um, some traits favor section Lepidella. Some traits favor section Validae. Um, Oh, geez, what's the species? Oh, I should have. Well, well, anyway, uh, you're not going to tell from the spores because they have amyloid spores. Although sometimes the amyloid reaction is. Is there a question? Okay, sometimes the amyloid reaction, uh, especially from some of these fence hangers, um, can be a little bit weak, uh, but my my experience with mushrooms that clearly represent taxa from sectional epidella have 
uh, spores that are strongly amyloid, like this one here would have spores that are strongly amyloid. Mm -hmm. A lot of the le so-called lepidellas have strong um, odors also, strong, usually unpleasant odors, except for Amanita pseudo, um, or sub, sub not pseudo, sub -cochari. Smells like cedar. It smells smells nice. Uh, most of them have unpleasant odors, though. Okay, I'm sorry. I can go on and on and on and on. There could be a yeah, lot well, of questions as well. But yeah, well, uh, that's we awesome, Dave. Move that, on. that kind of wraps up all of the sections here. Seven sections. Seven sections. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dave. I really appreciate you going through all of that. Yeah, I tried to to squeeze as much as I could into a few minutes, but it's you can go on and on and on and on. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. I'm going to I'm going to open this up now for the for the second hour now to um people with their um observation. So um, I'm going to do it in order that I've gotten these guys already, and then if um people have stuff they want to show, um put it in the chat, and we're going to try to move along here. Like I said, three species, five minutes per person. Um, and Liz, you are up. Okay, I will try to talk fast. Um, <laughs> The first one is a beautiful mushroom. I, I love this genus. It is just, they're just beautiful mushrooms. This Amanita submaculata we found up in Stokes um, the end of August this year. And I picked it up and it really looked a lot like an Amanita brunisians. It looked like it had the little cleft. I thought, hey, I actually know what this one is. And I picked it up, brought it over to Igor. And he goes, oh no, smell that. And it smelled like mint toothpaste. It was unbelievable. And um, it turns out this is called the ballroom Amanita because it's got the uh, skirt on it like a ball gown would have, which is, is kind of neat. Um, it has a cap that's kind of a grayish brown and it's covered with um, kind of grayish brown universal veil remnants, which are the warts, which... Uh, so, and you can also see it's spotted, hence the word maculata means spotted. And it's not quite as spotted as the real maculata, so I guess we call it submaculata. But you can also see the fibrils there along. It's very pretty. And then if you look at the base, Luke, you can also see it's got a bulb. Okay, and you can see there's gray remnants from that universal veil around the bottom as well is and this this stuff yeah that stuff well some of it's dirt sorry about that it was kind of a dirty thing but no they, there is actually gray gray warts in there um the let's see what other exciting things about this one it was under a big old oak tree and it's part of section validate you know it's got that universal or the um, partial veil that dave was talking about and it's got a prominent bulb, but not really um, a bulb and not really a sac. And the spores are amyloid and they're kind of elliptical. But this one, because of the smell, you don't even need a microscope. I mean, it was pretty, pretty neat. I was impressed with this one. Also, the, the, uh, the partial veil is, forms a really large skirt-like annulus on the stalk. And, and uh, that's why it's called bar, ball room gown amanita, because it, it, the stock looks like it has, has this gown on, on the upper part. Yeah, it's, it's really a very pretty mushroom. And it's one of those that you can recognize without a microscope, which is also kind of fun. You, okay. Usually you can, yeah. But, it, but as, you, as you mentioned to begin with, it's not that difficult to confuse with um, brunescence. Yeah, I picked it up and I thought that's what it was. You know what Rod told me is that if you actually um, kind of crush up the base a little bit and put it in a paper bag and seal it for 24 hours and then you smell it, you can, you can get a better scent because sometimes you read his descriptions in Amanitatia and you're like, I don't know, I don't smell that. But um, he suggested that as an option too. Okay, and this one, Amanita mutabulus, is one of my very favorite mushrooms. It's just such a pretty little mushroom. And uh, again, we found this in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. This one we found, um, I guess, in September, but I started finding these at the very end of June. It is in section Lepidella, 
and its nickname is the raspberry staining lepidella because if you can see up at the top there uh more on the cap loop right there there's it's called a raspberry sherbet staining you can see it's kind of a magenta color which is so cool and it actually does have a distinctive smell it smells like anise which sometimes is more prominent than others this was one i really didn't smell right away and i, mm -hmm. I posted it and rod had suggested that i stick it in a bag and it's got a lovely base on it it's um got a big bulb a globose bulb there, no, no, yeah. and it has a flap like oh, bulb you know, you know, which, hello which they call one, a limbic give, give me one I second here liz i'm gonna mute everyone again okay sure and then you can just unmute uh, yourself immediately <laughs> there we go okay that's okay. better all right okay but it's got a uh, globose big bulb at the bottom and it also has um a vulva and they call this limbate which i guess is pretty characteristic of uh anise raspberry limbed lepidella is what actually i naturalist nicknames it but um it's it's really beautiful if you cut it right down the middle you can see this staining better but i didn't do that on this one i think there's another picture luke yeah it was just one more there you go there that good. that's good you can see the um appendiculate material on the margin that dave was talking about Absolutely. and that comes from when the, the partial veil breaks away and it leaves some remnants there it's it's just such a pretty little mushroom and it was i always thought it was kind of unusual but this year they've been all over the pine barrens i've you know found it pretty much every time i went out from you know maybe august through september actually the appendiculate material on the cap is from the universal veil oh okay which we really want to want to make sure we distinguish from some mushroom some of the mushrooms in section amanita will have parts of the universal veil i'm sorry parts of the partial veil cling to the cap margin instead of making an annulus in in particular um amanita praecox um amanita crenulata can do that and there's a few others in section amanita where you might see stuff hanging from the cap margin but it's not universal veil it's it's the partial veil which would have been an annulus if it's stuck to the stem a little bit better oh thank you i have to say that that one i think is mycorrhizae with pine because i i find it in franklin parker and other parts of the pine barrens but it's usually under pine but there are oak always nearby as well but i think it is mycorrhizal with the pine and and this guy um amanita species 57 is another really beautiful little mushroom and i found this one again i thought it was pretty unusual but this summer it made its appearance in a number of different places um and it looks a lot like amanita levi striata which is the gulf coast lemon one but that's more of a southern species go back to the very first picture loop yeah that one and you can see that this one is covered by um by warts from the universal veil and they're dark it's darker in the middle it's more of a yellow sometimes it's almost brown and uh, nina and i found one in ted styles that was almost greenish yellow it was almost like a fluorescent green and um it does look like it has striations but i don't know if those are pseudo striations or not and at the bottom there you can see that there are remnants of that universal veil that are yellow you can see it around the base and um it is this in section amanita well guess what it was in section amanita and actually you know every now and then like i certainly don't consider myself any expert but i can do melzer's reaction i can do some basic stuff and I took it home, I did a spore print, I did Meltzer's, and I looked this up as Levi Striata, and um, I kind of thought, because we found it before with Nina, that it was this species 57, but when I looked it up on Rob's website, it put it under um, section Amanita. And this had an amyloid, it was weakly amyloid, but it had an amyloid spore print. And right along the edge there, you can see it's on the slide. It's sitting on a paper towel, but this is actually on a slide. 
And um, the spores were the wrong shape. You know, they were more subglobose or a little bit of ovoid, not like the others. So I went to my lifelines. I posted it. I two lifelines. Well, three really. I have a number of people that I really rely on for help with um, identification. But I posted it on the um, Amanitas of Eastern North America face, or I guess it's just North America Facebook page. And I know that Rod and Dave Wasluski and um, a number of other experts always look at that page and they would help me out with it. So I posted it and a few people went, no, that can't possibly be that, you know, have amyloid spores, it's not right. You know, the Amanita um, website actually says it's in section Amanita, but that can't be with the amyloid spores. And, you know, I'm certainly no great scientist, but I looked at that and went, no, this is right. And Rod Toulis looked at it. I sent it another thing. I gave Igor a sample to repeat it just because I thought maybe I'm doing it wrong. And um, it turns out, no, he actually had it in the wrong section and they're moving it to selection Floyd A. And Igor had mentioned that there was a recent paper that had moved it into a different section. So every now and then, we little citizen scientists can actually make a contribution. But, um, and this one I've always thought was pretty rare. We didn't find a lot of it, but this year, pretty much um, every time I went out in Clayton during the summer, certain areas, heavy, heavy oak, it must be mycorrhizal with oak, uh, I found it. And we also found it at Horseshoe Bend this year. And I think, what other phrase? There were a couple of other ones that we picked it up with, but, um, and I'm not sure if it actually has pseudo striations or real striations it, it, but you know one of those pictures it looks like, like they look like real striations yeah that's kind of my gut it didn't show up so much on the real immature one wow so this is this is kind of a fence sitter see i don't know this species I'm, i've never identified this species well you know what igor says it seems to follow the 195 corridor here and it's ah. true you know clayton park is right off that corridor but then we found it up in 100 and county which is not right along that corridor. Now those spores, you didn't collect those on paper and scrape them off. Nope, I, collect, I usually put them right on a glass print. Glass. All right, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's I had a to go truly look at amyloid that. Re reaction of the spores. I had to go look at that and I thought, ooh, maybe it was the paper, but no, I actually collected it. I usually um, do them on, right on the paper. Another thing Nina pointed out to me, I'll just mention one more thing because it's pretty helpful. If you get a really immature amanita, like where the partial veil hasn't opened up yet and you wanna get a spore print, there's something called geotropism. And if you put it upright, it has to be upright and kind of balance it. I balance it between two slides in a cup. It'll continue to open. I put a damp paper towel on the bottom of it and um, it'll open up over a day or two and you can get a nice spore print from it. Because for spore measurements, I guess you have to go from the spore drop, not so much from like a gill smash. Right. But that was cool. Okay, I'll be quiet. Thank you. Well, thank you, Liz. All right. Yeah, nice species. John and Nina. John and Nina, are you there? That's John didn't unmute me. Oh, ah. okay. There we are. <laughs> Right, I think. Keep me quiet. <laughs> okay, this is this is one that came in my backyard in central New Jersey, and Igor called this um, a Amanita penetrans because it it uh, it's buried way deep in the ground. There's a long, uh, it has uh, it has um, it's in part of the vaginata. Its uh, cap is brown. This it it has striations. It has a little umbel as you can see, um, and uh, no ring. And it's like I said, buried deep in the ground. Um, and so that's ego help me on that one. Yep, that would be series penetratrices. A what? Series penetratrices. What do you mean series? It's it's a subdivision within section vaginate. And oh. honestly, I don't know what distinguishes a um, a subsection from a series from a starps. Oh. Well, I honestly it, don't know. But Rod saying. calls it series penetratrices, which includes 
the tax on uh, penetratrix. Because and, it's penetrating the ground, right? I mean, it's just yes, really all of the all of the one all of the the species in series penetratrices. One of which, by the way, is pseudo penetratrix, <laughs> uh, because it looks just like penetratrix. Um, they all have the very deeply, and they have this umbo um, in in the middle of the cap that's thick and hard, and it's part of the way the mushroom is a, is a, able to push its way up through the ground from deeply underneath the surface is is this this thick umbo this little raised um pump in the middle of the cap it's hard and thick and that that's one of the features from a series penetratrices otherwise yeah uh, as you say it's in section Vaginate, so it's got strongly striate cap margin and no, no partial veil. Well, it has to be tough because I live in like solid clay, and in order for anything to push up, it needs to work hard. It's gonna, yeah, you, you can see yeah. that right there. Yeah, yeah, right there. So, all right, cool. Mm -hmm. Can you have dimensions one? of that roughly? Uh, it's a what do you mean dimensions? Oh, it's a, it's a fairly large mushroom, yeah. It's about the size of a bisporigio or something. It's, it's pretty large. Yeah, you can kind of see these oak leaves sitting next to it. So, kind of give yeah, you some the idea. mushrooms in series penetratrices can be pretty large and it's, they have especially long stipes. Yeah. Uh, which, which has already been said that they can be buried very deep, fairly deeply. Okay, this one has been shown, I guess. This is the um, Banin, Baningiana. And I think we already saw this. Yep. All right. It's a probably banning Iana. That's probably. what I said. It's part of the Caesarea. Yeah. Yeah, there's I a few. Find them run. There's a few of them that are like yellow, orange. Um, and Rod says that one or two of them might might be undocumented. He's he's got numbers for a few. Well, of he, them. he identified this, so that's I, it that's, looks like banning Iana. Okay, next one is this one. This one, I, I got all excited because I thought that it was a, uh, uh, Jacksonia. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And then I looked at oh shoot, it's not at all. Uh, but it turns out it's a, it's a Amanita parsivovada. Is that how you say it? Or parsivovada. And it's, it's, it's a very beautiful mushroom. And it, the the stalk the the stem is yellower than it, it shows in the picture. This is in section Amanita, I believe. Uh, this is in yeah Amanita. Uh, let's see what a section yeah Amanita. Yeah, it does. But it doesn't <laughs> have the membranous um, universal veil. Uh, the basal vulva. Okay. Uh, so. The basal vulva is just it's just like ridges and warts on the base. And maybe maybe a patch on the cap. This okay, one doesn't well, it, show that. Yeah, part. it has striations on a cap. The the yep, it striations. Yep. It has no ring, warts, and it has a few warts in the cap. Um, does, and uh, um, and uh, the gills are free. Does this one have no partial veil right from the get go? Do you know? No. Yeah, it has no ring. No ring at all. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't find this where where okay, I am. And, and it's it, you can find a description of this on um, uh, Mushroom Expert, and uh, and Rod was the one who identified this. So what makes it an ammonita? It's uh, it doesn't have a what does it make it? It doesn't have a it doesn't have a ring. It has striations on the cap. I don't know what makes it an ammonita, but that's what. Um, it's there it's there too. are. There are other microscopic details um, Can't remember. that that um, that distinguish genus Amanita. Um, there that's, tends that's, to be no no cystidia on the. I was going to say that's probably beyond the scope of our uh, discussion tonight. Um, yeah. I bet I bet if you went to mushroomexpert.com and started reading their section on Amanita, he would probably explain that more right. in depth than what we'd be able to right now. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, that's a cool okay, that's one. It.
<laughs> and then since we didn't we didn't look at your other one, so um oh. Oh. This one. I was gonna pull this one up since we didn't look at your other one. Oh yeah, this that, that's uh that's the um persicana that that lives in the uh, pine barrens. It likes it's sort of a southern mushroom. And that uh that that one right there is a part of the uh section amanita. That's section amanita, huh? Yeah, it's similar to muscaria. Right. Um but the basal vavas can be is a little bit different and the color is a little bit different and the ring is not very <laughs> persistent it usually falls apart it yeah, does have a partial veil but the partial veil falls apart usually it, it, it used to be part of the muscaria but they took away that title yes that used to be a variety in muscaria now it's a species in its own right tends to be south of the mason dixon line um, but it does come up along the coast in into new jersey I, I found it once here in Pennsylvania, once or twice. That's kind of the cool thing about the Pine Barrens is we often find these uh, southern things, not just mushrooms, other things too, like reptiles and amphibians. It's kind of like an outlier of the southern, more southern ecosystems. Okay, thanks, okay. John and Nina. Yep. Okay, Susan, you there? Yes, I am here. Yes. Uh, so this is my picture of Amanita banningiana from probably quite a few years ago because I took it in New Jersey. Yeah, just the one picture. Of, I, I tried to limit how many pictures because you said you had a lot of people. Anyway, the very distinct color of the darker in the center is kind of funny yellowy orange color, striations at the edge, a wimpy kind of a veil here and a wimpy kind of a stack. For many years, we kept saying, oh, this is gonna be Caesarea or Jacksonii or whatever. And it wasn't until we saw the real Jacksonii, which is next. But anyway, this is, I'm glad to see that you folks are still finding this as a common mushroom in New Jersey. Because this, in Roger Phillips' older version of his book, um, he has it as an undescribed species or we used to call it Amanita number 16, which was the number that Rod assigned to it. Before, did he finally actually publish this name? I don't know, he's got a lot of unpublished names. Well, I was just curious, at least we're all using Banningiana, but. Um, yeah, it, but, but there's a few that actually look like this that are a little more orangey or yellow um, that he says might be something else. Well, but this so looks it's like interesting. Banningiana. It's interesting that we are still finding things that are perhaps not described. Is this yeah. described in I Washington? find this in Pennsylvania. Yeah. By is the way, I it's a it's a I I, I don't want to encourage experimentation, um, but it's a pretty good edible actually. No, I would not eat any amanita. Yeah, <laughs> that's not perfect. Well, tonight. Like the favors, uh, maybe close I to retract you. my my statement. <laughs> No, don't eat any amanita. Although, right here, the reason I wanted to show this is right here. This is off the table. Um, the uh, Canadians in Montreal do a thing at their botanic gardens every year in September. And this is a few years ago. And this they find a lot of. Um, and as you can see, comestible means edible. Oh, yeah. So the Canadians eat this. But if you look at this, it's very distinctly bright orange, bright yellow, yellow down the stem, huge white sack. Uh, and I have a, the first time I actually found it myself was last year, which is, um, I think, the next picture, Luke, isn't it? Yeah, this beautiful, huge white sack, thick, <clears throat> beautiful yellow gills and yellow veil, and then this beautiful, smooth, orange cap. You can't miss it. It's like a beacon when you come across it with very striate margin. But this one, one thing, one thing though, um, Jacksonii, which, which I, I imagine you're calling this Aminia Jacksonii, which it probably is because that's the one, that's the red or orange Caesar that is most likely to be found in, from my area on northward into Canada. Uh, but one, but there's there's a couple other red or orange cap uh, Caesars in North America that are not Jacksonii. Yeah. And yeah. and one of one of the distinguishing features is the um, 
orangish ornamentation on the stock, like this fluffy or flocos or matted ornamentation on the stock. Now you can't really see it on this one, but I think probably it's it, it's there. Yeah, I think I can see well, it a little bit. Well, having found this south of where I am, and for the 11 years that I've lived here, I, this is the first time I found it this a, a year ago. In where, where did you find this one? Uh, Elk Lake. It was uh, Elk Lake is sort of near Newcomb. I've I've actually been to Elk Lake. It's the beginning of the trail that you can take to um, Panther Gorge. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is I'm sure this is very common in the Adirondacks. It's just that I have not found it. Um, it it is. It is common in, in, in the Adirondacks and North and New England as well. I, I was going to say, it's, I, more it's interesting, in down here in like the Philadelphia area, I've never actually seen this species, but when I went to like a Neff up in Maine, I remember seeing it everywhere. Yes, right. We got lucky I think it's a more northern species, right. Yes, the ones, there are ones Maine. that look like Jacksonii that are in the southeast that are, that are, that are different, there's some different species, and I think one or two of them might not have names yet. Yeah, I remember one seeing one off the table in West Virginia at a nom nomophory maybe 10, 12 years ago. Um, and I forget, yeah, they had a different name for it there. Yeah, this is your New, Jer New Jersey version of Amanita phylloides. Um, I'm just going to say one thing about this. When I was in Denmark one time in the pouring rain, um, I was with a bunch of the Danish mycologist fungi fiber people. and um, we came across a huge fruiting of Amanita phylloides. There wasn't a pine tree in sight. There was no conifer whatsoever. And, and I kept saying, where's the conifer tree? He said, oh, no, no, they kept telling me it's with uh, oak over there. So what's interesting to me about that, I said, well, the only time I've ever seen it in New Jersey, it's been under, um, in this case, it was Norway spruce. This is in Bernardsville, New Jersey. Um, it's jumped hosts when it came to this country. So do, do, does, do people understand what that means? In order for this mushroom to survive, it's a mycorrhizal fungus. It has to connect to a tree. It didn't have the tree of choice when it came over. It maybe came over in uh, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco in the 30s, I think they thought, um, with a, some sort of a planted conifer tree. But then it, in order to spread, it had to attach itself to some other species of tree. It must have come over on oak and jumped host to conifers here. So anyway, um, I'm glad to see that this is still typically growing in New Jersey. I have not found it in the Adirondacks yet. Susan, in, in many parts of Europe, they collect Boletus edulis under hardwood trees, oaks and so forth. Which, which is equally interesting to me. Belita said, I was with Roy Watling, whom you should at least know who that name is. Yes. Years ago, and we were in a place that he studied for many, many years, and we found Belita Sedulis, and believe me, if Roy Watling tells you it's Belita Sedulis, it is Belita Sedulis, and it was under a huge oak tree. So I think the original Belita Sedulis does grow with oak. And what we no, in, in Italy, that's where they that they say they get them. Huh? In what? Italy, they say yeah, they I get. Think, well, we know that's here. a species complex anyway. That so. that's true. Yeah, that's, it's it's being sorted out actually. All right, yeah, well, let's yeah. move this back back to the Amanitas, okay? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I know we get we get excited, right? All right. Well, thank you, Sue. Appreciate it. Yeah. Dorothy, it's your turn. Carthy Smolin. Dorothy, unmute yourself. Sorry. So before I start talking about the mushrooms, in the latest issue of Fungi Magazine, there's an article about Mary Elizabeth Banning on page 26. And also to new, new members. Um, on one of the Victor Gambino weekend forays that our club uh, have in the spring, that our club has in the spring, uh, Igor gave a wonderful program on uh, Amanitas. So we give credit to him. 
And also though, many years ago, one of our club presidents, Glenn Boyd, uh, he would create cheat sheets. So I don't know if you can see that, but we, except for Caesarea, uh, he's got all the sections on this page with some descriptions and another uh, page of the common uh, Amanitas. So if you're interested in those um, and you want to email me, I can, you know, send you copies, but they're, they're very useful, even though they're, you know, maybe years old. So the mushrooms that I have, this one right here, I took many years ago in the Great Swamp, and um, this is section uh, Valade, and it's what we call now um, Amanita amerorubescens. Um, it will have red staining, and it's pretty common, and it's probably a complex. So next. How do, how do you know it's not flavor Rubens? Um, not enough yellow, really. Anyway, the next one. This was one of the um, species that um, I did the mycoflora project on. So uh, we even did a DNA study on this. Section Lepidella, it has the appendiculate uh, material. It has a rooting stem, even though it's covered by a lot of dirt down here. But the prominent feature here when you dig it up is this incredible, rather large bulb, and in some cases very abrupt. Um, it has um, beautiful uh, pyramidal structures on the cap, and um, it's Amanita abrupta in section Lepidella. Are, are you sure about that, Dorothy? Abrupta, yes. Abrupta has a basal bulb that it, it usually has like a like a sh it's like a shelf. It like forms like yes, a shelf it, on the bottom. This one is a, a, a smoother shelf, but it also has this. Um, this one shows that more, a younger one. Over here. And it and it was a. DNA came back okay. Yeah, okay. I can see, I can see. Um, yeah, that's a little bit atypical for, for that species. That's interesting. But if you, if you look at some images online for that species, many of them are also not as abrupt as the name implies. You know what? Rod told me that once, um, that, that the, 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 the the basal bulb is not always as abrupt as, as you would as you would expect. Most of the ones that I found around here, though, it, and, it is. But so uh, that's interesting. This was the first time I found it, and it was right across the street by the river. So um, I was happy to find it. The next, uh, there's two slides of this one. Um, section Amanita. It has striations. Um, with an annulus, a non-saccate vulva, and at the base, at the base, you'll see the this uh, collar, or as um, Dave pointed out, something like a rolled sock, or, or is that what you said? <laughs> so, That's what he calls it, rolled sock vulva on the subsection panth panth Yes, this is yeah. Amanita multisquamosa. Multisquamosa is what I would call that one. Yeah. Yep. So very similar to Philatopes. The color's a little bit different and the ring's a little bit different on Philatopes. Also, is, the, a tricky thing with some of these so called panthers, when they're young, the striations might be difficult to, to discern. And on this, you can see that here on the button, you can hardly see, you can't see striations. But on the one that's starting to open up, you can see the striations starting to form. And on the last slide, Luke, mm -hmm. the cluster of the three of them. Right, do you, do you see on this one how the 
material between the warts uh, are, are, is very, pretty dark. And then it's here lighter and even here, even lighter still. So, so that shows, and this happens in boletes too. You know, there's a certain amount of pigment in the cap tissue, but as it, the cells expand, the pigment gets spread out and so it looks paler. So that's something that, you know, maybe a beginner may not know, um, which is uh, different in some other mushrooms. Um, this, this is a good example too, Dorothy, of the way the universal veil, you can see in this button, all this white stuff is barely broken up at all, then how it kind of continues to expand outward and how it turns into these little warts. Right, and break up, breaking apart each time as it spreads. Yeah. All right. So that's, awesome. that was another one I did with the Mycoflora project. So thank you. Yeah, this is an you, interesting Darcy. species also because as it expands, the striations become really long, but, but you don't see it here in these young ones. So. Okay, I'm gonna show, I'm not gonna show the Amera rubescens because we just saw that one a minute ago. Um, I have this example from something from section Lepidella that we called sub -cochari. This one is similar to that one that Dave was showing, the Atkinsoniana, like really big. Look at it, it's got like this, uh, it's got the, um, what do you call that? The appendiculate material hanging down. One of the things I thought that was interesting on here is you can see this blue mold on it. There's a note in here from Igor that says that he was told by um, by Rod that almost any time in southern New Jersey when you find these big amanitas with the blue mold on them, they're almost always sub -cochari. And there was also a note in here um, where we were talking about how similar this is to the Atkinsoniana, right? Or Atkins, so how am I saying that right? Yeah, Atkinsoniana. Yeah. Yeah, and you were going to point out the difference. Right. Is, the, uh, is the way that the warts on the bulb. Yeah, the recurve, these have the recurved warts, whereas the Atkinsoniana has what warts that go all the way up, right? They go all the way down the bulb. They're, they're all they the way cover down. the entire bulb. And sub cochorae, they're usually only on the upper half. There we go. Yeah. So they kind of peter out like right around there and they're smoother. Yeah, that's the way they down. go down pretty far, but but they're bigger too. The warts are you sub sub car uh what was I'm sorry, what how did you describe Re it? The recurved. Recurved, yeah. Yeah, they're bigger. They bend. The um the, the vulval warts on the base are are bigger than than Echinsonia. Also, this is the one that smells like cedar. Yeah, there was a note in here, um, I guess from Rod. What did he say? Um, for, uh, mix of burnt sugar and cedar wood. But others say close to bacon or watermelon. I don't think I had much to say beyond that. I said it was, <laughs> what, what can I you say? It does have a distinct baconish nature to it. I'm sorry? My talkie mushrooms, I've noticed, do have a distinct baconish nature to them when they're yeah. cooked. Okay, well, well, these are not my talkies, though. These are uh, Amanita subcochorae. Uh, it, has, it has a double veil. That, oh, yeah, the double ring. Yeah, yeah. Has a double ring? Yeah. Yeah, it's got, you can usually see two tears on, on the annulus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, a little hard to tell on this one. Yeah, but... my picture's a little grainy. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's that one. And then the only other one I was going to show is uh, this one. I learned this in this group, this Roosevelt, Roosevelt tensis. So I learned this over the summer from other people in this taxonomy group. Um, and it's kind of a cool area where I find these in this church lot that I drive by every day. And it's always full of mushrooms in the summer under these pinooks. So these are section vaginate, so the striate caps. Let's see if I can blow this up. Right, the striate caps, right? The lack of the partial veil, 
the lack of the bulb, right? And then you have these low, this real membranous um, sac down there. And these I finished up with the, the, the spore measurements. So they're kind of like more globose. Actually, actually, the thing that distinguishes Roosevelt tensis is a fair number of the spores will be ellipsoid. So if you go back to the spores, we're going to see that at least some of them are ellipsoid. I'm sorry, you're right, ellipsoid. I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong term. That's what, that's yeah, that what I meant. That distinguishes Roosevelt tensis right. from most of the other vaginate. Right. Most vaginate have globose, glob, subglobose spores. Yeah. Roosevelt then, tensis has the um, ellipsoid spores. Right. And then there's there's like all the there's like several different taxa that end in ensis, um, Baton Rouge ensis, um, and then a few other locations in North America that are related to Roosevelt tensis have the ellipsoid um, broadly ellipsoid spores, but they don't give the same DNA and they look the same as well. So, but it's very just, common here in yeah. in the um, you know upper mid Atlantic, um, up into New York State. I pick sometimes I see sometimes fifty to a hundred of these on my lawn. Um, yeah, when I when I find the these at this church, um, in this church um, lawn, there's you know dozens of them sometimes. It's pretty cool because I drive by there every day on my way to work. So in the summertime, it's like a little, uh, <laughs> a little beacon. I always look for it. When, when we first, when I first moved in here to the house I'm living in here out in the country, uh, back in the year 2001, I I was strictly a pot hunter back then. It was before I discovered the internet and digital cameras, which really was a game changer for me in in this mushroom hobby thing. Uh, but I was all like psyched about finding Boletus agilis or, or whatever on, on my property, four acres. And there were all these little silver gray amanitas all the time. And they were like really getting on my nerves. Like I would, and, and it as them. it turns out, I, I collected enough of them to, to be able to contribute to the um, um, description the of, of, of the species eventually. Right. So. That's pretty cool. All right, Maricel. You there? Yep. Yep. All right. Can you make it bigger, please? Yep, okay. Those are your two choices, that or that. Oh, <laughs> oh geez. Okay. Yeah. Stay right there for one moment. I really don't know anything about Amanitas. Um, one day I was driving in, in Chatsworth and I saw something on the side of the road and I thought it was a bowl, a paper bowl that was like garbage, but I couldn't resist to stop and I came back with the car. And when I mm, stopped finally in that area, it was this Amanita. Um, I was reading that it reached 21, 22 centimeters in diameter in the cap. And, uh, and we were calling this. Yeah, wait. Here we go. Amanita polypyramids. Okay. So um, you can, uh, and the the type could reach uh, could be three point five centimeters in diameter, and when I held it, the veil fell off, and there are pieces uh, hanging from the edge that are falling off, and I got powdery stuff in my on my hands, and it's covered. They cover the type and also the cap, and, and the cap has like pyramids. Okay. And it's a little white the name means. base. Lots, lots of pyramids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I could not believe my eyes the size of that thing. I don't have more photos. How did it smell, Marisol? I cannot remember. Huh? I, I don't remember anything else. It was in 2016. I don't remember in the fall. <laughs> yeah, Polythrem is, is, is a lepidella that has not a whole lot of basal structure. Uh, most of the lepidellas have either this like really notable bulb or a, or a notable bulb and or uh, and a uh, vulval remnants on, on the base. But polypyramus just has like generally this grainy stipe and that it, it's grainy all the way down from top to bottom and the rim usually falls off like this one. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, yeah, I saw the pyramids on the top. It was beautiful. It was gorgeous. You can see a, a piece of the, the veil hanging in the right side from the edge. Yep. No, under, under, under the glyphs. Mm -hmm. Right side. Yeah, I'm there. I can't move my cursor because it moves. Oh, like, it, oh I see. <laughs> I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. That's awesome. All. That's all I have. Thank you, Marisol. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop sharing now. That was a lot of Amanitas there. Um, so, Bianca, oh, Bianca, okay. So, Bianca says she sent me something on the six. That's right. Hmm. Okay. I'm just. Sorry. I have a few. Okay. Um, well, we have about 15 minutes left. So, Bianca, we get two. And then let's see, Bianca, if I can find yours. Are you still there, Bianca? Oh, I yeah. can see it. I don't mind actually doing it myself. It'd be easier, I think. Oh, okay, great. That's fine. I could find it though. It wouldn't take that long. Yeah, no problem. All right, let's see. I think it's this one. There you go. All right, so these are the mushrooms that I had found. Uh, the years uh, and date is on it. Uh, and I also put what I guessed the mushroom would be actually just from our talk today. Uh, so here we go. Let's let's start with potentially Lepidula abrupta. Can you see this one? It's a big version of it. Or uh, yeah. All right. Let me let me reshare this one. All right. How's that? There you go. So this is what I believe is the Lepidula abrupta, but feel free to correct me. It has those triangles, a large veil, uh, but I don't see anything hanging from the, uh, the edge. And I did not dig up the mushroom, though I will be doing that in the future to show. It looks like a, looks like a Lepidella, and abrupta would, would be likely, I would say. Um, but you really need to dig it up. You need to see the bottom. Yep. I will do that in the future. All right, let me see if I can get to the next one. There we go. Can you see this one? Mm -hmm. I do not have a name for this yet, though I think there was something similar. I have a second picture of this for the underneath. It has the big one and the small one in it. There you go. It has that gorgeous large veil that's still attached to the gills. Any suggestions? One of the, one of the rubescents. Um... Uh, I'm one of the Amera rubescence taxa. There's like five different ones. Some of them have been named, I think, but I don't know the names yet. But uh, um, yeah, it looks like a blusher. This is one of the blushers. Great. Thank you so much. I just typed that down. All right. So I'm going to move on. And I got a little spider there as an added guest. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right, so moving on. Uh, this guy is not an Amanitis, so I'm going to skip it. <laughs> so it was quite large, and I wanted to share. All right, so this guy, uh, I believe it was another Benigiana from the Cesare. Uh, so it's got the bulb, it's got the partial veil, uh, and I will show further pictures. So it's a small one. It has the um, the warts from the universal veil on it, but very. The ba base of the stock is wrong. Right. This is this is something in Validate, I think it doesn't have the sac-like membranous basal vulva. It's it's got just it's got a bulb. Plus, it has a bulb on the bottom of the stock. Um, mushrooms in section Cesare wouldn't have that. Okay. Uh, this is either Flavoconia or Flavorubens. Okay. Um, so did the, did you guys get that? The the key feature there that gave it away was this big bulb at the bottom, where Cesario yeah. would be, would be uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Cesario would be straight with a sack at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 more or less equal, or maybe slightly enlarged toward the base, but more or less equal, and inside a sack-like membranous vulva. Yeah, so so this is validate. If, if, if section validate, if you were, if you were to test 
the spores for this for amyloidity, you, you, they would turn turn black in melters. Great. Yeah. No, no striations on the cap either. And this, this cap looks to be fairly ma mature. Yeah, it, it does look like, like it. Uh, there was also this one uh, from- we have, to, we have to stop there, Bianca, three, three species, okay? <laughs> okay. But just, just to, uh, this looks like something from Amadella right here. Okay. Um, but I'm not, uh, the, the low confidence. Okay, sorry, let's move on. Thank you. Thanks, Bianca, appreciate it. All right, Kay, did you want to go? No, 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 that's okay. I've got the same thing as everybody else. Okay, then um, let's see. Um, Helena, I think you are next in, in the queue. I think it's Helena, right? Bauer, Bauer Schmidt. H. Bauer Schmidt. Hi, I'm sorry, it's Helena. Can you hear yeah. me now? Okay, it. perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I just have two quick uh, two quick things to share. I'm hoping this is going to come up large. Did that come up full size? Yes, sure did. Okay, perfect. Um, I just thought this was really unusual looking, at least to my inexperienced eyes. Um, I found this in Homedale Park um, in this, this past summer. Um, and then there was very close by on the same park, there was this other... Um, observation and I was thinking that both of them were perhaps the same species and they're both equally odd. Um, I don't know, Atkinsoniana perhaps? Dossipes probably. Yeah. They're just young. Dos well, yeah, probably Dossipes. Something in Lepidella at least. That's for, that's pretty certain. Dossipes. Something in Lepidella. Okay. Long turnip uh, root like carrot like going into the ground base you don't see it in the picture but if you had dug it up entirely it might be about another six or eight inches down into the ground wow did, okay did you happen do we to think... smell it i didn't i didn't but i will next time for sure um are we thinking the same for for this one as well yes. or this might be something okay yes so they're just they yes, both caught my eye that day also, you yeah. say Hondell, which is a sandy coastal plain kind of location, which comes to mind for this sort of thing. I find them all oh. in Clayton Park, and they look a lot like that, especially when they're young. And then, as you said, you dig them up, and they have that big rooting base. Very cool. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, I thought they were really, really cool looking. They smell like old ham or sweet. They have a really peculiar smell. Okay, I'm going to have to check that out next time. Thanks so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Sorry. You're welcome, Helena. Get the name in the chat for that. Oh, Amanita Dossipes? Oh, well, somebody who's better at spelling. <laughs> okay. C-I-P-E-S. Sigrid? One thing that wasn't mentioned in any discussion is that a lot of these things you've got to dig down into the ground. There may be quite a lot of the bottom of the thing below the surface of the ground. So in order to even tell that it, it's an Amanita, you need to dig it up. Yeah, I should have mentioned that actually in the introduction. You need to extract the entire stock when hoping to identify an Amanita. The, a lot of times Amanitas are identified from the bottom up where some of the most uh, telling features Will will be seen on the bottom of the stock. Yep. So take your knife and dig them up. <laughs> or get a tin stake, and then you don't dull your knife. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's a good idea. Perfectly. All right. So what do you got there, Sigrid? I only have one, and it's for a friend. And she's she's an artist, and she's making a book with mushrooms. So she needs an ID, and she's asked me to help her out. Um, so this is what this looks like. Uh, it's obviously a lepidella of some some sort. Um, and she might have cut off the root when she dug it up, uh, is my worry. So obviously that's an important feature. It looks like this. And then it has an ap appendiculate margin. Any thoughts? Is this longy piece maybe or something else? Need to see the bottom of the stock. Okay. Could be longy, could be uh, abrupta even. You mm -hmm. know, we just don't see what's going on down there. Okay. Another lesson and dig it up. 
Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Sigrid. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not okay. use that mushroom in in a field guide or or any site of because it's it's lacking feet. Um, very important features. Um, it's an artist book, so it's more about the aesthetics and not about identification. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay there was a question here. I'm just going right through the chat in the order that they were typed in. Um, there was a question that says, "Can I use cotton blue stain to check the spores?" Um, and I would say no for that. Yeah. Melchers, Melchers is specific, and that has the um, what is it? Iodine in there, right? And the iodine's reacting with, I believe, sugars in the um, spores. I think that's starch. what's going on. The starch. It's reacting starch. to the starch. So cotton blue is only staining it. It's not really, um, it's not reacting, it's, it's not giving you the iodine reaction that you need from Melchers. So. Yeah, you're not going to notice that you, you can't tell if the spores are amyloid from cotton blue. I wouldn't use cotton blue. I use Congo red to mount amanita spores. Um, if, if there's any question about subgenus, then I'll look at, uh, I'll put some melters on a spore print to see if it reacts. But when I mount the spores on, to look under the microscope, I usually use Congo Red. Um, otherwise, if you just use like KOH, a lot of times it's hard to see anything um, because the spores might be pretty much transparent. Um, but I wouldn't use a cotton blue. Cotton. Uh, All right. So it looks like that's everybody that was in the queue here. Um, we'll come back to this in a second. I wanted to, because it's almost nine o'clock and I know some people are gonna wanna sign off. Um, give me one second here. I'm looking for my announcements. Okay, so before we sign off, I wanna make sure everyone remembers that this Friday is Rene LaBeouf on Belites of Eastern North America. So this is a lecture. You guys should have gotten a link earlier this week. Um, this is on Friday night at seven o'clock. And then we have like a double header on Saturday morning. John Dawson is doing a lecture on slime mold. So hopefully everyone can make it to one or both of those. Um, and then next week for Taxonomy Tuesday, um, following up on Rene's um, Belite lecture, we're just going to show our own bleed. So we're going to do the same thing, three three specimens per person, try to really get through with everyone. Um, but we're just going to follow up on her lecture with um, our photographs and see where we can go from there. All right. So I got all that in. So if anybody wants to sign off now, they've gotten all the information that they need to. Um, I thought I heard somebody else say they had another Amanita. So I'll, I'm going to leave this open for a little bit. If people still want to show Amanita. I just want to show one thing. This book is wonderful. I don't, can you see it? Yeah. We had Jay Justice talk on Amanita. Have you ever read the, uh, the Audubon Society's Mushrooms of Colorado? That's a great one. Oh, okay. This one I really think is great. And it explains all the sections and subgenuses pretty well. Right. has beautiful color photos, but it, it only has a key to the Lepidella section. Mm -hmm. It needs more keys. I'm a I, key person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was a little disappointed by the lack of keys, but it is a beautiful book. And helpful. So, awesome. Well, was, was, was there anybody else that wanted to show Amanitas tonight? I have a couple. Okay, we can look at them. And just my last one, maybe? Anybody, I know it's nine o'clock now, so some people probably want to leave. So I'm going to say good night to everyone. We covered everything we needed. So, um, so this is like overtime. So if you want to stick around and keep looking at them, you're welcome. <laughs> if not, I'll see you guys I, next week. I figured I would just show off just the most comprehensive and most artistically known, you know, fly garrick mushrooms. But not in New Jersey. <laughs> no, these were in Alameda when I was visiting my sister. But like, it's neat. Where was mm -hmm. this one? Alameda. It's amazing. That? I just, California. It's in California. Oh, 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 oh so that's Muscaria. Uh, Flavia yep. Volvada, I guess, is the. It's in oh, the yeah. area. Yeah. yeah. As you can see, just how beautifully that veil just separates in that vibrant red. I drove myself mad in ceramics trying to mix glazes to mimic that, but never came out right. But, um, other than that, 
this did happen in New Jersey. Evan, Christmas Red is a pretty good one. I have tried to do that, but it, when I was I was using Raku at the time, so it always made everything come out matte for red. But it was still a very interesting pursuit. But I will definitely look that up. Was is that stoneware? Ah, uh, yes. All right. So these are. This is actually what I found around um, Montclair State University, of all places. Apparently, um, outside of Blayton Hall, there's this patch of pine trees that just result in a massive amanita bloom every year, like that. You're not. You're not moving forward in photographs anymore. Yeah, I still see the California one. Oh. Oh, okay. My apologies. Huh. Um, I'm very new to Zoom, so Luke? sorry about that. Can we tape Renee's program? Record it? Renee LaRousse? Yeah. Um, it's up to her if she'll allow us to. We'll ask before we can, and okay. if she lets us, we will, and I'll send it out. Thank you. You're welcome. This is the one I was um, talking about in Montclair State University. Um, that is a very interesting place to visit because surprisingly, there are quite a few mushroom blooms that happen there per year. Yeah, it needs to see the bottom of the stock. Yep. Just a couple of these death caps. And I was amazed just how many of these that sprout up around there around the pine trees. It was always breathtaking whatever it happened. And we're just seeing your thumbnails. I see a, like a whole bunch of little pictures. Yeah, we're just seeing your thumbnails. Oh, that's weird. Okay. How about now? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think those are death caps. Those are Amanita velatipes, probably. See the base of the stalk has the mm -hmm. rolled sock basal vulva. Mm -hmm. um, the cap has lots of little warts on it, which you're usually not going to see on phyllaides. The cap is more yellow. And that's the same as this one, you think? Because this looks like, yeah. this looks a little bit British. like phyllaides, except the, the ring on the one is pointed the wrong way, but sometimes it does that. We're looking at image 34676, 3476 right now. Mm -hmm. Is this the same? Yep. as from that bunch of mushrooms that you were showing exactly. a minute ago yep yeah they're probably all velatipes usually velatipes has a, the ring that is like an inverted funnel um these this is like a skirt like annulus here which is unusual for mm -hmm. velatipes but but i think that's what this is velatipes it could be crenulata but the other ones um, don't have the, on the on the other ones you showed a minute ago. They have um, the basal structure is not like crenulata. It's like philatopes. It's the rolled sock, the panthenoid. Yeah. Um, that whole entire area is like a weird petri dish. They bloom in mass culture all at once, and a few irregularities tend to happen. It's pretty. Yeah, well, some it's often been said that. The, the mushrooms don't know how to read the books. They don't know what they're supposed to look like. So yep. uh, often you'll see anomalies, you know, in terms of uh, morphological traits. Uh, Velatopes is supposed to also have a striate cap margin, and that doesn't look to be the case here. But hmm. this one's probably not just, it's, it's just not mature enough. Hmm. You can have yeah. under the same say you have one kind of tree wherever this is on montclair state you can have several different amanitas under the same species of pine tree okay yeah, yeah you yeah. have to look very carefully 
at them to see if they are the same or, or whether you've got some slight variations. And oh, that's of course. what makes it really interesting. Exactly. Like these two, the ultimate cuddle buddies. They could be two different species, but that's they right. at least know how to connect. They could. They could be that close together, though. They're, they're probably the same. Yeah, 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 be that sure. When we look at the collar, it's just, eh, and the coloration. It, it is true. You need, to, you need to really pick, you need to dig down and get the bottom. And then when yep. you take a photograph, try and get the underside of uh, at least one of them, or take more than one photograph. Yeah, you need to dig them up and be careful about how you do it. So you get the base of the stock. Right. And right. if it's rooting, you need sometimes you need to dig down pretty deep, deeply. Um, yep. but, that but, base of material could fall off while you're digging it up too. Well, for, I'm kind of weird. For the most part, I just like observing them in their natural habitat and letting them play out their role in nature. I usually don't dig them up unless I have a true need for them. Well, that you're not going to be able to identify some of them. That's that's just that, the way it goes. Yeah. All right. Do you have any more, Evan? Uh, let's see. To uh, do 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 do. I have a few. Like, um, let's see. Well, let's see one more species and then call it call it a night there. Okay. Okay. Uh, Seeing that one? No. Thumbnails again. Oof. How about now? Yes. All right. Not this an Amanita. One. Yeah, that's not an Amanita. I was Forbidious, very young. maybe. Ah. Okay. So that's what I got. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Evan. Thanks for sharing. You're yeah. All right. Yep. Thanks for viewing. Is there anybody oh, else yeah. that we did not get to? If I skipped over anyone, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't think I did. I think I got everyone that was in the chat. Anybody? Going once, going twice. Well, awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Dave, thanks the time for the t taking the time of going through all the sections for us and everyone that contributed for tonight. And I yeah, hope, see hope they cover else. everything about the different sections. Really, it's so easy to. Overlook. Yeah, I know. You you could you could do a whole semester on Amanitas, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's only so much we can do in two hours. So, all right. Well, I hope to see everyone on Friday night at the uh, elite lecture, or on Saturday morning. If not, I'll see you guys next Tuesday. All right. All right. Take all right. care. All elites next week. Thanks. Thanks. It was great. Thank you. All right. Thanks.